Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. We are happy that you're here with us today. Uh, and I'm going to start off by reading from Colossians 1, 24 through 29, uh, where we're continuing in this series. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up uh, or read it from the screens. Colossians 1, 24 through 29 says, I am glad when I suffer for you in body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. And that's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I'm glad when I suffer for you, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, we're going to talk about suffering, so it's just what it is. It's what the Bible talks about, so I got to do it, right? It's my job. Uh, we don't talk about it often, but it does affect every single one of us. We all suffer from time to time, maybe for long times, really long times. Uh, it hits all of us, and thankfully, the Bible has a lot to say about it because God cares about our pain. And that's really good news, especially when you're suffering. But to say that you're glad when you're suffering, how do you have that sort of attitude in a way that is both truthful and healthy? <laughs> like, how do you say that you're happy when you suffer in a way that's truthful and healthy? You know, I, fit, I spent a fair amount of time this week, I went down the rabbit trail a little bit of like reading stories of people doing this well. Uh, and there's, it's, in a good way, it's overwhelming the amount of stories that you can find of people who have suffered really, really well, but it is overwhelming. There, there's just so many examples. There's stories of people in concentration camps and places like that, like Corey Tim Boom that you may have heard of. There's stories of people who choose to live in the middle of suffering and pain, like Mother Teresa, who you've probably heard of. Uh, you could find loads of stories of people who have lived their entire life for long chunks of it in chronic pain and illness, probably people you haven't heard of, but stories that are worth telling because they're powerful. There's stories of people overcoming tremendous grief like Jerry Sitzer, who lost his entire family in a car accident and still chose Jesus. There are stories of people finding Jesus in the middle of debilitating uh, depression and attempted suicide, like Janetta Pace. There's people sitting around you who I'm not going to call out because they would hate it. Um, so don't worry, I'm not doing that. Uh, but there's people sitting around you who have done this really well who I could probably tell stories of people sitting around you who have dealt with chronic illness and pain for years and still found hope in Jesus. People who have gone through years of miscarriages, infertility, death of children, long bouts of depression, long periods of financial struggle, you could look around and probably pretty easily find somebody who's gone through something like that just sitting right here with you. Because the reality is, is that we all deal with suffering. Every single one of us. At some point in our life, things happen that hurt. You know, I thankfully, uh, but odds are this will not be true for my entire life, have not had chronic long-term things that I've struggled with. Um, 
but in my limited experiences, I can relate to the difficulties of just how hard it is just to keep your mind on Jesus when you have pain or depression or things like that that are constantly coming at you. Just the simple, like it's not even that you're angry at Jesus, it's just that it's hard to focus in those moments. Like I can connect with that. Uh, about 10 years ago, I had the privilege of walking with my dad as he died um, from bone cancer, which was terrible at the end. It was in his spine and his hips and his ribs. Um, so three of the, the worst spots to have your bones start to break down. Um, and I, it was a two and a half year process, which was like the grace of God that it was that long. Um, but I, I saw him go through that pain um, I didn't fully register until after he passed how much pain that he was in in some of those moments. Uh, but I saw him, you know, keep choosing to stay engaged. I saw him uh, preach until two weeks before he died because that's what he loved to do. He loved to pastor and he wanted to keep doing it. And he loved staying connected to the people that he was pastoring. Uh, I, I saw him stay connected to his kids as he was going through it. Uh, I spent the last 36 hours of his life with him uh, and watched that process, which was terrible. Uh, but I saw God's grace in the middle of that. I said that I didn't fully realize his pain until afterwards because I had the privilege of being the one who got to go with the hospice nurse to look for all the pain meds in the house after he passed. Um, and we were looking and, and we found this huge box in his closet that was filled with um, not used pain pills. And the hospice nurse just looked at me like it was, he was a friend of the family. He knew us and, and he was like, your dad chose pain, constant pain for years so that he could stay engaged. Like it was just the reality when we saw how much medicine he didn't take uh, so that his brain could stay, you know, fully engaged. My story isn't unfortunately uniquely sad though. And many of you may be sitting here like, yeah, I've, I've been through something like that because we, we all have similar stories of suffering. We feel the camaraderie in it, the, the shared experience of going through periods of life that hurt like this. Whether it's because we are dealing with our own physical pain, chronic or sudden, or we're, we're going through uh, emotional suffering, depression and anxiety and suicide attempts, and panic attacks and undiagnosed mental illness, or we're going through kind of situational suffering moments of financial struggle and extended job loss and housing and food insecurity and infertility, or a marriage falling apart or death of a loved one or temporary separation from loved ones, or in some situations, maybe not for us, but for people throughout the world, persecution. And in all of this sort of thing, Paul says that we can have joy in the middle of those situations. <laughs> How in the world is that possible? Scott McKnight says that Paul's theology of suffering is this. It's a Christologically based suffering leading to a Christologically energized life. Christologically based suffering that leads to a Christologically energized life. That was how Paul lived. And if we can understand what that sentence actually means, we can learn the secret to being able to live like Paul did in the middle of suffering because it holds a treasure trove of wealth for us but it's only found in Jesus. And so my goal this morning as we continue our series in Colossians, this series that we're calling that this changes everything, that Jesus changes all parts of our life, is that we can be grounded theologically and practically so that when suffering comes, we have practices 
that root us in the midst of that so we can engage well and we can experience joy. Let's pray and then we'll keep digging in. Holy Spirit, I just invite you to come even more than you already are. And God, I just pray for for us this morning as we talk about a subject that has like a thousand different trigger points for every single one of us. For those of us that as I'm talking are thinking about our own current situation and the pain that's found there, I pray for you to bring light and comfort. For those of us that look to the past and remember, I pray for you to bring hope for more and an understanding of where you were in those moments. For those of us that uh, look at suffering with just anxiety and dread, I pray for you to bring peace. God, I thank you that you are the one who comes and meets us in the middle of where we're at. Not after we get through it, but in the middle. And I pray that in our lives just today, that you will be a God that is here in the middle of where we're at, that we will see you and hear you and know you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you don't know Paul's story, you may have heard that first line and been like, that dude is idealistic. Uh, That is unreasonable and unreal. So let me tell you, what Paul went through, the stuff that we know about Paul. Over a course of about 20 to 30 years probably, uh, he went through constant verbal opposition and abuse by religious leaders of various faiths in every single town that he was in. Uh, He dealt with false accusations in legal settings. Legal issues came up in response to that that led to short and very long, years-long imprisonments. He was physically kicked out of town, and they didn't just nicely hand him a letter that say you're evicted. They usually kicked him out, beat him, stoned him, or whipped him. And he was betrayed fairly commonly by people that he thought were friends. On top of that, the situational stuff because of following Jesus, it's rumored that Paul had some fairly significant eye issues that would have caused him a lot of struggle. So this was a guy who understood suffering. Uh, He understood suffering a lot better than I did. He lived through it constantly. So how is he able to have this attitude in the middle of all of that for decades? What I want to do is I want to kind of break down that statement that Scott McKnight gives us because I think it leads to understanding this well. But I do want to say that like I'm not the expert on this and I did utilize lots of experts on this. So if you're like, okay, this is good, this gets me started, but I need more, um, there are some books that I would love for you to read by people who are much smarter than me. Uh, N.T. Wright has a great book on, uh, it's called God in the Pandemic. Uh, It's not just about the pandemic, but it's kind of his theology of suffering. Uh, That would be great. C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain is fantastic. And Pete Gregg's book, God on Mute, is uh, just a really fantastic book on understanding unanswered prayer and suffering. Uh, so those are a couple. Um, I'll give you those. If you want those and you didn't catch them, I'll, I can tell you afterwards uh, what they are. But how was Paul able to have this attitude? I think it's because he was theologically centered in Jesus. So the first thing that he's centered in, in Jesus, is that he's centered in the truth of the kingdom of God. That as followers of Jesus, we cannot be comfortable in this world. So N.T. Wright says this, all Christians will suffer for their faith in one way or another. Woohoo! If not outwardly, then inwardly. All ways of suffering, properly understood, are things to rejoice in. Not casually, flippantly, or superficially, but because they are signs that this present age is passing away and that the people of Jesus are the children of the new age. 
such suffering is actually regarded as evidence that the sufferers really are God's people. This is why Paul can talk of rejoicing in his sufferings, as opposed to merely rejoicing despite them. Just as Jesus was known by the path of suffering he freely chose, so his people are recognized by the sufferings that they endure. What he's getting at is that our world is marked by things that we can't be comfortable with. Our world is marked by sin, by illness, by death, by addiction, by pain, by brokenness of, of many different sorts. And we can't feel comfortable in the middle of those things because we're not made for those. That's good. Jesus didn't make you so that you would be filled with sickness and death. That wasn't his plan for us. And by choosing to follow Jesus, when we enter the kingdom of God, we begin to be transformed almost immediately. And so interiorly, we start to change. And the more that we change, the more we become like Jesus, the less we can be comfortable in spaces that are filled with things that are opposite of Jesus. It doesn't work. It can't coexist. And so as we become changed, as we're people filled with the perfect love and the wholeness of God, we start to feel like there's wrongness around us. Something's off. Like, I'm not good with this. And in that moment, we're given the choice to embrace joy because we are made in a way that doesn't fit with death. That we're made in a way that doesn't fit with sin and brokenness. That we've been transformed and changed, that there's something different in us. We rejoice because we are uncomfortable with things that I am good with being uncomfortable with. That's the first thing that Paul was centered in. The second thing is that he's centered in the truth that following Jesus means participating in the suffering of Jesus. So how do you participate in somebody else's suffering who was suffering 2,000 years ago? Uh, what's that mean? Pete Gregg says, and God on mute, in our celebrity-obsessed world that is cosseted away from death and anesthetized against pain, we need to be reminded that it's normal to have problems to get sick, to experience financial challenges, and to face relationship breakdown. The Christian witness is not merely a miraculous succession of escapes from all human affliction. Rather, it is the joy of deepening relationship with the man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, who loves us and lives in us. The joy of knowing someone who suffered because Jesus suffered. He suffered in huge ways. He felt the pain of betrayal of somebody close to him. He knew what it was like to have somebody die and somebody that he loved. He suffered from the grief. He had periods of deep inner turmoil where he felt extreme loneliness and lostness. He was physically suffering. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was stabbed. He was crucified. He was verbally assaulted on many occasions. So Jesus suffered. And Jesus suffered on purpose because his suffering had purpose. He suffered so that you would be free. His suffering was, was necessary it was required for us. He suffered so the evil would be broken and so that we could experience ultimate joy. And so the invitation in the middle of suffering is to connect to Jesus who understands suffering and to embrace the fact that there could potentially be purpose in the midst of terrible. That that doesn't block God's will from going on but that he still works in the midst of 
broken. But we usually just ask like, well, that's great, but like, why can't he just like wipe it away? You ever asked, you ever thought that? Like, hey God, why do you allow this? This is nonsense. Like, why are you doing this to me? C.S. Lewis says, beyond all doubt, God's idea of goodness differs from ours. The goodness of God nowadays almost exclusively means his kindness. What would really satisfy us would be a God who said, that anything we happen to like doing, why does it matter? Just so long as you're content. We want, in fact, not so much a father as a grandfather, a senile benevolence. (laughs) Kindness, merely as such, cares not, and this is where the rubber hits the road here, it cares not whether its object becomes good or bad, only that it escapes suffering. It's for people whom we care nothing about that we demand happiness on any term. If God is love, he is by definition something more than mere kindness. And it appears, in true C.S. Lewis sarcastic fashion, he says this, it appears from all records that though he has often rebuked us with contempt, He has paid us the intolerable compliment of loving us. In the deepest, most tragic, most inexorable sense. The problem of reconciling human suffering with the existence of a God who loves is only insoluble so long as we attach a trivial meaning to the word love and look on things as if man were the center. Mic drop in 1940s British way. Uh, The dude knows how to lay it out. Why does God allow it? Maybe a better question is, why did God allow Jesus to suffer? Because there was a purpose. And honestly, you and I, can't see long enough to know the plan. Because we don't know what our life looks like in the future. We have no idea. We guess, we hope, we plan. We have no idea. God does. God does. And so we have to trust. But what we can't do is lie to ourselves about it and make ourselves into martyrs, although we try and do that sometimes. There is a story in the Bible of somebody who did a little bit of that. His name is Job. It's not very many people's favorite book in the Bible. Uh, My dad, actually, who I mentioned, uh, would skip it um, because he hated the book of Job. He was like, why do I want to talk about suffering? This doesn't sound fun. Uh, (laughs) I don't think he actually preached on it all that much, you know, but that's okay. That's between him and Jesus. Uh, But Job is a book of wisdom. It's a book of poetry in the Old Testament, uh, right before the book of Psalms. And uh, because it's a book of wisdom and poetry, it feels like it. So it's a little bit weird sometimes. The story is a little different. Uh, And it starts by a conversation between God and Satan in heaven. So I'm not gonna waste any time on the theological reality of whether or not that happened, but it is a book of wisdom and poetry, not a history book. So that's all I'll say, okay? I won't go any further. But it says that Satan goes to heaven and, he, and he's like talk, trash talking God, like nobody like is actually that faithful to you. They'll fall apart all the time. And God's like, false, Satan, false. Let me tell you about Job. And so he starts like saying how good Job is. Uh, It's like squad goals. Like, I hope that sometime God talks about me in that way. No, I actually don't. Because then what happens afterwards? Um, But like, you know, if you read the rest of the story. um, But so he's like, Job is, you know, all of this. And and he's great. And Satan's like, yeah, of course. Because you gave him everything. 
You made him rich. You gave him a great family. He has nothing he needs. His health is even perfect. Of course he loves you. Why wouldn't he? You know, you're the benevolent uh, boss who gives him all the things that he wants. Like, who wouldn't? And God says, okay. When Satan says, how about if I test him and we'll see? And he lets him. And the rest of the book is, store, is, is dialogue between Job and God and Job and his wife and Job and his terrible friends who uh, come and, and say bad things to him after he loses everything. He loses his kids. He loses all of his stuff, his wealth. It's gone. He even ends up losing his health. And so here's what his friends and Job ends up doing wrong. The first thing that he did wrong, that they did wrong was they accused Job of being evil. They said, if bad things are happening to you, it's because you are bad. Listen to this, Job 4. And if you have friends like this, stop being friends with them, by the way. Like these are, like they're not friends. They're terrible. Like it's not worth it. Uh, it's just not even, don't go there. Uh, they say, stop and think. Do the innocent die? When have the upright been destroyed? My experience shows, <laughs> listen to me, that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. Yikes. So they say like, hey, Job, buddy, pal, only evil people have bad stuff happen to them. Praise Jesus that that is a lie straight from hell. That is not true. But this dude's not the only one who I've ever heard fall down that path. And it can happen. And I've heard people from stages say things like, if you've been sick for a long time, what are you doing wrong? And of course, if you know that you're sinning, repent. Yes, duh, we get it. But suffering isn't only a thing that happens to evil people. And in fact, the history of the world shows us that evil people often don't suffer all that much. That is not always what happens. The good news is that that's not the reality. So toss that out. Again, if you're sinning, Repent. Clear, right? You're not a bad person because you're suffering. That's a lie. The second thing that his friends do is they accuse him of abandoning God. They said in Job 15, have you no fear of God, no reverence for him? Your sins are telling your mouth what to say. Your words are based on clever deception. Like these guys are terrible. Your own mouth condemns you, not I. Your own lips testify against you. The good news is at this point, at least, like God speaks up and he's like, you guys, shut up. Like you're done. Like get out, stop talking right now. This is bad. And God says, this isn't the truth. Because God says, hey, Job is trying. And you know the beauty? If you've been in a, like, in a place of struggle, and you're saying, God, I haven't felt you in a long time. I feel super disconnected. I'm going through terrible things. Where are you? I feel like my faith is falling apart. If you're able to say those things, your faith may, it may be hard, but your faith isn't gone because you're still trying. Trying matters to Jesus. Keep grabbing a hold. He will meet you. It took him a little while with Job, like a long while with Job, but he came. Don't give up, keep grabbing. The third thing, and this is something Job did, is that he tried to justify how good he was and how he did not deserve anything. Uh, listen to what he says about himself. All who heard me praised me, all who saw me spoke well of me, for I assisted the poor in their need and the orphans who required help. I helped those without hope and they blessed me. This is my favorite line. 
I caused the widow's hearts to sing for joy. That's, that's beautiful. Everything I did was honest. Righteousness covered me like a robe and I wore justice like a turban. I served his eyes for the blind and feet for the lame. I was a father to the poor and assisted strangers who needed help. And I broke the jaws of godless oppressors and I plucked their victims from their teeth. Uh, this is a bit heavy, <laughs> like that's a bit much. Uh, a little bit too self-righteous, Job. Don't fall into that either, making yourself into a martyr, saying, I'm just as good as Jesus, basically. Why does this happen to me? Well, if you're just as good as Jesus, he suffered pretty terribly. I guess that doesn't avoid, that doesn't change it. Here's what we can learn from the story of Job. There is evil, and there is evil innocent suffering. We definitely do not know everything, but God does, and he's always working, and we are not God. That's pretty guaranteed. But what did Job do well? It's what I said earlier. Job stayed, and friends, when you stay, you're doing well. You're meeting him in that space. And as Job continued to stay, as he continued to pray, and he continued to struggle, he grew. He deepened. He became more than he had been before. He became a person who could actually stand in the middle of extreme suffering. Because Christologically based suffering leads us to a place of a Christologically energized life. An understanding of suffering based in the truth of Jesus, the kingdom of God can lead us to a place of living well, of living joyfully. And Paul gives us tools for how we do this. That's the good news. The first thing that he did, that Job did, that Jesus did is that they prayed. Dr. Barbara Peacock wrote that suffering is often part of the journey that leads to freedom. While prayer is the discipline that undergirds the complexities of the process, we must pray. This is our resource that never dissipates. This is our energizer. I love that. It's your energizer bunny. It's the battery that doesn't give up. You know, the disciples would watch Jesus when he was going through hard times, when he got tired, and what would he do? He would go away and pray. Sometimes for an hour, sometimes for a night, sometimes for like days on end, and they didn't know where he had disappeared to. And they would watch him come back, and then he could feed 5,000 and preach for days, and he was good. And they said, how do you do this? Like, what's your secret? If this is what prayer looks like, then the way I'm doing it is very wrong. So teach me what it looks like to pray. Like, teach me. And, and it wasn't anything crazier than what they were doing. But he just put the time in. Friends, I don't know what you rely on when you're in a hard spot. But if it's not prayer, I would suggest, and I'm saying this to myself too, that it should be. Prayer should be the thing that reinvigorates us, that energizes us, that makes us go. It can be alone, it can be with people, it can be silent, uh, it can be out loud, it, it can be a flood of words, or it can be an hour in silence in God's presence. But we need to pray because if we can practice prayer when we're not suffering, then we'll actually be able to do it when we are. Amen. Here's the second thing from Paul. It's in Colossians what we read. It's we need to stay focused on the calling of God for our lives. Colossians 1.28 that we read earlier says, tell others about, so we tell others about Christ. We want to present them to God, mature in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's power that works within me. We tell others about Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard. 
That was what Paul was called to do. That was his, his calling, his, his reason for being here was to do this. And he stayed focused on it when he was in prison, when he was being whipped, when he was being kicked out of town, when his eyes were failing him and, and he couldn't see, he had somebody else right for him. Like he stayed with it. Because in the middle of suffering, if we can stay focused on what it is that God's called us to do, we'll find joy. And it's a joy that will go way beyond watching the, the Netflix comedy special that we really liked that lasted for an hour and then we just started thinking about the other thoughts. <coughs> Although laughing is good. It's a joy that's much, much deeper. The third thing is this. Paul worshiped because Jesus is always good. There's a story in Acts of Paul and his friend Silas getting beaten and then thrown into prison. And when they're in prison, uh, they're up late at night probably because their backs hurt and they couldn't sleep, which would be reasonable. And they start to sing. They start to praise. And as they do that, in super miraculous fashion, an earthquake happens, uh, the, the jail, like their chains fall off, the doors open. I'm not going to explain any of that because I don't know how all that happened. That's Jesus' job. But like... All of this stuff happens and everything is turned around immediately as they're worshiping. Their situation changed dramatically. I wanna watch the story of a woman named Helen, I believe, who uh, is from another country, but who went through a period very similar to Paul's, worshiped and things changed. So watch this. eight o'clock. The whole area is just quiet, so only you can hear my, my voice. So there are 600, 700 around people they gather. So when I start telling about the gospel, people they start crying. Even Muslims continue. Nobody throw no stone, just keep silent crying. But the government they say we must put her far from the city so she can't pray, she can't do anything. There is around 23 metal shipping containers. When we came closer to the container, I saw young people, they start us. The guard, he came and he opened one container, he pushed us in. The container is not clean, it has small insects. So he starts crunch your body. We are asking, where is the light? So he said, no, where is the light? In the night, it's extremely cold. Just I say, the only we can do now, we sing. We have no toilet, we have no nothing. We sleep on the floor and I'm hungry to tell people about the gospel. The word of God, you have power. So I say, God help me, give me word. So all the time I'm writing four to five letters every day for prisoners. I have been for two years now. They ask me, Helen, what is the Bible? So I told them, I have no Bible. So how how you remember this? You have been for two years, but you, you write like this. So how you remember this? So I told them, it's in my mind. In your mind? So they start beating me a lot in my head and long beating. So after a word, he says, just go to the container, he kicked me. I stay the whole night, it's bloody pain. Early in the morning they came again. But now you must stop teaching guards. I told him, no, if somebody came around my container, I'm preaching, I can't stop preaching. 
So he start taking this uh, stick. When he beat you with this stick, you feel the whole your body fire. They know where is the nerves. So my body starts shaking by, by itself. Helen, you must stop preaching God. So just I kept silent, his eyes red and yeah, he beat me countless. Now it's the, the last one because I have no energy, I know. So just I start preparing myself to die. So uh, at last he's totally exhausted. So just I look at him, yeah, you did your job. Also I'm doing my job. So they took me to other container, the worst container. It's dark, I can't see anything. Just I'm standing and um, <laughs> start singing. Just doesn't matter. God gave me a new song. So just I'm singing the whole night. All the prisoners can heal. Thank you for everything, God. The bad toilet, cold, hot, everything because I, I love to worship him. He's my father. After the last uh, torture, I stay for eight months, but my situation just I'm very sick. They don't have enough medicine. They think I'm dying. They don't want you to die inside the prison. They don't want to take this kind of responsibility, so they send me home but always security around me. I ask God, please, I need to leave this country. I stay for 10 months treatment. Within one month, the Danish government accepted me. I'm, I'm start to sing and write my own song. There's a, as we end, there's a, another letter that Paul writes in Romans. And he says this. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Friends, suffering is guaranteed. Friendship with God is not, but it's an option. And thank you, Jesus, that in our suffering, which is going to happen whether or not we want it, that we can be made into friends of God, that we can be filled with his love and his joy, and that we can look forward to when he returns, knowing that we're being prepared for something so much better than the brokenness around us.